So welcome everybody. We'll just wait a, a minute or so just to let everybody join in. Just waiting a little bit longer to allow other people to join in and then we'll start. Okay, so good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's webinar um, as part of our palliative care and COVID-19 series. Um, and today we'll be specifically looking at uh, detainees, um, LGBT plus people and persons experiencing homelessness. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly after completion. So my name is Professor Julia Downing. I'm the Chief Executive of the International Children's Palliative Care Network and I'm moderating this session today. So this webinar is number 13 in our series on palliative care and COVID-19, developed jointly by the International Children's Palliative Care Network, the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, Palliative Care in Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies, and the Worldwide Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance. So the objective of the series is to provide globally relevant information and guidance to civil society and UN organisations, policymakers, administrators and healthcare providers on palliative care within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I'm sure you're aware by now, the webinars are accompanied by briefing notes written by experts from around the world. And these briefing notes are available on the globalpalliativecare.org website. And the webinars are also uploaded there and onto the WHPCA website. And we are very grateful to the contributors of the series and to today's presenters for accepting our invitation to participate in this collaborative project. So this webinar will have a similar format to others. We have three 15 minute presentations with time at the end for questions and answers. And we're also gonna have reflection following our presentations um, from a low and middle income perspective and also from an Argentinian perspective. So throughout the webinar, you can submit your questions through the chat box and Kate from WHPCA will be looking at the questions, reading them and then uh, posing them to the speakers at the end of the session. And when you're submitting your questions, please remember to select to all participants so that everybody can see the questions that are being asked. Um, so we've had, a, we've had support from a range of experts from around the world in developing the three briefing notes that accompany this webinar. And it's been interesting to hear the experiences and challenges from different perspectives. So our first presentation is a joint presentation. Um, firstly, sorry, there are no conflicts of interest from any of the panelists that have been declared. So our first presentation is a joint presentation by Dr. Catherine Pettis and Marvin Mudge. Catherine is known probably to most of you here and she's the advocacy officer for the International Association of Hospice and Palliative Care. And we're delighted that Marvin is able to join us uh, today as well. He is a formerly incarcerated prison reform activist He's a director of advocacy at the Prisoner Reentry Network and associate director of the Humane Prison Hospice Project. He served 41 years in prison after receiving an indeterminate seven year to life sentence for a 1975 murder in Union City, California. He was wrongfully convicted of that murder and he was freed in 2016 due to the work of Professor Heidi Rumnell 
USC Post-Conviction Justice Project, Professor Susan Rutberg from the Golden Gate University Innocence Project, and attorney, attorney Michael Snedeker. We are delighted that Marvin is able to join us today. So I'm going to hand over first to Catherine and then to Marvin. Thanks everybody. Um, I am going to whiz through the briefing note so that you can have more time with Marvin because you can read the briefing note which has all the references and details that I'm just going to touch on. So the issues that we're going to be talking about, next slide please, um, Stephen, thank you. Um, is that the pandemic is increasing the need and the demand for palliative care in custodial settings worldwide where basic health care services are fragile or non-existent anyway. Uh, many older detainees who are already very sick and particularly vulnerable to serious health-related suffering need palliative care. And health systems in general and custodial settings in particular are under great pressure, as we all know, further reducing detainees' access to basic health services in violation of existing international human rights standards. Next slide, please. The Mandela Rules, um, which were uh, a, a resolution approved by the General Assembly of the UN in 2015, state that prisoners should enjoy the same standards of healthcare that are available in the community and in cases where prisoners are suspected of having contagious diseases, particular attention should be paid to providing for the clinical isolation and adequate treatment of those prisoners during the infectious period, unquote. However, quality of health care in custodial settings is frequently below the national average and access to palliative care even more limited. Next slide, please. Key facts are that the proportion of detainees needing palliative care and end-of-life care um, are many, many times more than the general population in prison. Uh, the, the proportion in prison is higher than in the general population because the health care and health status of detainees is very low, many of whom come from um, very poor backgrounds and with poor health care. So legal availability of opioids to manage severe pain and breathlessness in carceral settings is often extremely restricted. And Marvin's gonna talk about that in the context of San Quentin now. Um, and that availability is often determined by the prison warden rather than medical professionals. Uh, globally, more than 11 million men, women, and children are held in jails, prisons, and detention centers, which are environments unsuited to COVID-19 infection prevention and control measures. Next slide, please. The current situation is that many countries are releasing detainees, but many medically vulnerable persons are still in custody. Worldwide, the few clinics, hospitals, and hospices that do provide palliative care to persons in custodial and community settings have cut services for all patients. They're either closing down completely, providing only telemedicine visits, or diverting resources to critical care for COVID-19 patients. Um, the last thing is that the majority of prison uh, palliative care services that do exist rely on peer caregivers for service delivery, which puts all of them at high risk of contagion, which is why, again, as Marvin will tell you, um, it's not happening anymore, even when there are trained peer caregivers. So our recommendations to governments are to embed both prison health and palliative care in all national COVID-19 policy responses, to ensure adequate availability of palliative care and palliative care medicines at community health care facilities for all detained persons in need per the Nelson Mandela rules adopted by all UN states, to reduce jail and prison populations considering non-custodial sentences for vulnerable persons, to operationalize and streamline compassionate release regulations, and to ensure that release detainees with chronic conditions are linked to community services so they don't become homeless and more vulnerable. Recommendations to custodian authorities are to ensure that seriously ill detainees receive palliative care, 
to provide health facility staff with basic training in palliative care and the use of essential palliative care medicines and or to transport detainees to a community health facility where palliative care is available. Uh, second, to ensure adequate availability of essential palliative care medicines, particularly oral morphine in all prison health facilities treating seriously ill detainees, to regularly test all detainees and staff for the virus, and to isolate those who are infected to prevent further transmission. Again, per the Nelson Mandela rules. And last, for custodial authorities to distribute and mandate the use of adequate PPE, soap, and disinfecting agents by detainees and staff. Finally, our recommendations to civil society organizations and families of detainees to advocate for increased access to palliative care in prisons worldwide and to petition governments and prison authorities to increase testing, activate broad compassionate release programs, and facilitate com communications and telephone calls from detainees to loved ones on the outside. Um, and I would actually add another recommendation there, which is getting a lot of traction in the States, I'm not sure about worldwide, which is to decarcerate and to look at the whole system of incarceration as a whole, because it's really uh, quite out of control. And this is just the first pandemic we're gonna be looking at um, in the next uh, few decades. Correctional health is public health, which is what the Lions had said a couple of weeks ago too. And we need to make sure um, that the community is kept safe outside as well as the prisoners inside. So thank you very much. Here's further reading and references. I would in encourage you to read the briefing note. There's a lot more detail and links. And then Julia's already introduced Marvin, so I'm gonna yield my time to him. Thanks a lot, bye. Thank you, Catherine. Um, as uh, you heard, I, I spent 41 years inside uh, mainly San Quentin in California. Uh, as a result of a wrongful conviction in 1975. And uh, during the course of my journey through the prison system, uh, I became quite intimate with the shadows and darkness that was my prison. And uh, on this side of the wall, uh, I am uh, somewhat of a an expert on the effect and the uh, the uh, damage that prison can do to an individual. I had a hobby uh, early on in prison. I started watching uh, people as they came to prison and even guards, new guards that came into the prison. And uh, I would watch as the prison took them over and you could almost tell to the day when darkness took them and they became part of the, the entity that was the prison. Uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, was not a surprise to us that it came into the prison. Uh, if history uh, is any indicator, uh, everybody should have been aware that prisons were gonna be a prime target for the, the pandemic and nursing homes. The Spanish flu uh, hit San Quentin very hard and killed most of the prisoners. Uh, it overwhelmed the little medical facilities that they had in the surrounding community. And today with the COVID-19, we were very careful. Uh, the prisoners especially were very careful uh, to try and keep um, contact to a minimum as much as you can in a in a four and a half by nine foot cell uh, that has two people in it and you have 700 people in your cell block and uh, you have to share eight showers and uh, facilities in the dining hall and everything was communal in the prison but we did very well we had no cases uh, for the first few months of the pandemic and then uh, a decision was made to transfer a hundred prisoners from 
a prison that was highly infected and they it was out of control and uh within days of that transfer into san quentin from this other prison we saw our first cases and uh now san quentin has um 67 people in outside hospitals uh they have uh more than 1600 people infected uh and 150 plus staff members uh within a month and a half uh it just ravaged the prison uh there's so many people are going to outside hospital that uh marin county the surrounding county around the prison and san francisco have said they can't take any more prisoners their hospitals are overwhelmed uh because as we were uh, sending prisoners out to the community for care uh southern california had already overwhelmed their hospitals and they were flying prisoners from southern california to northern california hospitals so the intake into the hospitals outside the prison has stopped and they put tents on the yard to have a mobile icu on the yard to try and take care of some of the prisoners and uh now they've decided they're going to take the machinery out of the furniture factory that's inside the prison where prisoners work to make furniture for state offices they're going to take the machinery out and put 200 beds in there and turn that into a a hospital unit uh, something that wouldn't even be imaginable in the community if if you were to tell people well we don't have any facilities so we're just going to put you guys in a factory and take care of you it's the the only the only place that scenario is even accepted by people is if you're talking about prisoners it's okay just put them in a just put them in a factory it's okay so um but we expected that i just i i just don't know how much people on the outside know about living and dying in prison uh when you um are lucky enough to go to a hospital you end up going to a locked room where you're handcuffed to a bed you're shackled and if you take your last breath in that room you're going to be taking your last breath in chains uh and alone if you die in your cell then your cellmate goes to segregation goes to to isolation until your autopsy is done and some of these men have been together for decades in those cells and uh when their cellmate dies they go to um segregation and they have to start their grieving process in isolation if they even know how to grieve so it's not uh it's not um uh uh, that uh extreme that they're going to put people out in tents because life is extreme in prison uh some of the things that that are um essential that we talked about in the briefing notes was that uh when people are getting medical care uh they're not allowed to have the community standard care that everybody else gets they're not allowed to have uh like Catherine said opioids to help for breathlessness and pain uh they are um locked away in uh in a isolated room or in a uh dormitory with other patients and uh they are not allowed to have contact with their family uh, they don't have a assigned a uh, physician so to speak they just have somebody who's making decisions that um other caretakers will execute in a rote manner so it's a very uh, harsh and uh and barren experience uh it's so bad at San Quentin that the men have gone on a hunger they have at least 20 men that we know of that are on a hunger strike and they're uh willing to sacrifice their bodies uh 
to have somebody outside the prison hear what's going on. We have a third of the prisoners at San Quentin uh, have um, been infected by the COVID-19 virus. Uh, the prison system as a whole is suffering under um, the, the hot spots in California are the prisons. And per capita, uh, we have more people suffering from COVID-19 infection than most states. So um, one of the healthcare officials in the community said we were the Chernobyl of prisons at San Quentin. This was a completely avoidable uh, thing that happened. But the prisoners were, were really trying to do due diligence just to keep the infections out of the prison. And uh, when the other prisons were infected, they stopped visiting. So no visitors were coming in. The, the virus had to come in to the prison through staff. Uh, so many staff are infected now that they have started bringing other staff members from other prisons to work San Quentin. And they're going back to their communities after coming into prison every shift. So the, the infection has spread out farther and farther uh, outside the prison into communities and neighboring communities and even neighboring communities to those communities. Uh, they've um, got so few staff members at San Quentin now that they've stopped feeding the men hot meals. They're giving them uh, prepackaged box meals uh, that consist of a packet of squeezed cheese, two pieces of bread, four crackers, uh, a package of sunflower seeds, and uh, uh, powdered Kool-Aid. And uh, there's no nutrition there. It's, it's processed squeezed cheese about a half a, um, a quarter of an ounce. Uh, to cover your bread. And so aside from, uh, in addition to being denied uh, medical treatment in the community or community standard medical care in the prison, they are also being denied nutritious food that's going to help their bodies fight off this thing that is lurking outside their bars and waiting for it's time to come in and claim them. And uh, one of the things that uh, you will hear most often in prison is that the deepest fear that people have in there is that they are going to die in prison. Uh, I had a very dear friend that um, committed suicide in prison. And as a result of that, um, we reached out to the community and tried to get uh, training, uh, and how to spot uh, uh, people who are going through these depressions that may end in taking their own life. And we were successful in having an organization come in and give us training. We became state certified in crisis intervention, suicide prevention, and male sexual assault survivor counseling. Uh, we created a group called Brothers Keepers, and they've always wanted to have. Um, additional training in palliative care, uh, uh, compassionate end of life care training. And we were, once I got out of prison, uh, I was contacted by uh, a colleague, Sandy Fish and her friend, Lady Bird Morgan. And they told me that they'd been trying to get into San Quentin and talk to the warden to start a hospice program for a very long time. And so we had lunch, we talked about it. Within a couple of weeks, our organization, the Humane Prison Hospice Project was born and we worked on getting them in to start delivering training to uh, my brother's keepers, which is the group that we formed after our state certification. We had 14 men in there who were, uh, who formed a group called Brothers Keepers and they were able to, to um, 
make themselves available for people who are going through depressions and uh, vulnerable for, to suicide. And they went from having a suicide rate six times the national average at San Quentin to zero because of these peer intercessors. Once they got their compassionate end of life care training, uh, a second class was trained and we have two classes of trained volunteers at the prison that could be uh, helping these people who are dying, uh, chained to beds and in their cells, uh, but they're locked in their cells and there's, there's nobody um, uh, going to approve them coming out and giving comfort to their uh, fellows. Uh, we had, uh, early on we had Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco both offer uh, their labs for testing of prisoners. And they were told by uh, the administration of the Department of Corrections that they were good. They didn't, they didn't need that. And uh, of course now uh, they're, they're admitting that they were overwhelmed and they, they needed to have do more testing early on. So this all comes from the fact that we don't have any kind of um, state, much less international mandate that prisoners are to be looked at as human beings. That if you're going to be a government that has somebody in custody, that you must at least give this minimal care to include end of life care and palliative care and community standard health care. And uh, it's not happening because people um, are, uh, those walls don't just keep people in, they keep people out. And so uh, for what they want to do inside the walls, it's necessary that people outside the prison do not look at these people as human beings. Because if you do, then people are gonna start asking, why are you doing that to them? So uh, it's a big industry. They spent $13 billion last year running 35 prisons in California. They're on track to spend $20 billion this year on prison in California. Uh, I just think it's time that we have an international uh, voice to join our local voices uh, and ask for um, the things that we have in our briefing notes uh, to be made something that to, uh, normative that somebody that we don't have to argue for anymore. Of course, they're human beings. And of course, they should have this um, hand of compassion on their brow when they're dying or, or sick. Uh, it should not be part of their punishment that you die in prison uh, because you have um, strayed from that straight path that a lot of people manage to stay on their whole life. Thank you, Marvin. I'm afraid I need to bring you to a close, but that was really interesting and really helpful. And hopefully, um, some of our, our group today will be able to uh, begin advocating on behalf of prisoners uh, around the world. And uh, I'd like to, um, there's quite a lot of information, isn't there, on your website, on the Humane Hospice um, Project website. Um, so you can find out more, uh, individuals can find out more. And if you have questions for Marvin, uh, please write them into the chat so that Kate can ask them to him later on. So thank you very much. Marvin for your your presentation and Catherine as well. Um, so it's kind of hard to move on from there but uh, moving on from that um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Richard um, and as many of you all know Richard Harding, Professor Richard Harding is the Herbert Dunhill Chair at the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London and he's going to be talking about providing palliative care to um, LGBT plus people during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll hand over to you now, Richard. Thank you very much, Julia. And again, thank you, Marvin, for an incredibly moving and memorable presentation. So thank you. I'm going to be talking on behalf of the co-authors of our briefing document, Maria, Julia, Juan, Jenny, Claire, and Billy. So thank you to them who have contributed to this. Stephen, next slide, please. Um, as a transition, really, 
between uh, the presentation you've just heard from Marvin and the presentation I'm going to give now, I'd just like us to pause for a moment on the next slide, Stephen, which is really thinking about our visions and our values, which I think is absolutely the core of this seminar today. Dame Sisterly, who of course we recognise as one of the founders of the modern palliative care movement, said, you matter because you are you. We matter as people, whoever or wherever we are. WHPCA, the mission, believes that no one with a life-limiting condition should live and die in unnecessary pain and distress. Our vision is a world with universal access to hospice and palliative care. And IHPC subscribes to commitment, excellence, efficiency, creativity, compassion, respect and service to others. And I think that vision really transitions us from everything that Marvin has said that's so important about everybody mattering and everybody deserving palliative care onto what I'm going to talk about now, which is LGBT plus people. I think that's the thread between our presentations. I'm sure most of you, if not all, will know who lesbian, gay, bisexual people are, or often men who have sex with men, or women who have sex with women who may not identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. I'm just gonna briefly uh, touch on what T means, transgender, so gender identity describes how the person themselves views their gender because gender is about your biological sex but it also has psychological and social factors we often presume that it's binary you're either male or female and you assign to one and you stay in that categorization well actually people don't always identify as male or female or they may not identify as the gender that they were assigned at birth a cisgender person, you may have heard this term, that's a person whose gender identity corresponds to their biological sex at birth. They were born male and, ident and given a male identity and that's the identity they keep. A trans person is a person whose gender identity differs from their biological sex at birth or the, the sex that they were given at birth. So I just thought I'd kind of bring you up to date with trans uh, terminology because it can often be quite stressful for people when they want to say or do the right thing. Um, and, and also a link to Marvin's presentation. I just like this is a global seminar from global NGOs. So let's just take a moment to think about the worldwide context. The dark colours and the red colours are where there is death penalty for being LGBT or imprisonment for being LGBT or where or in orange colours where legislation is used to imprison LGBT people. Uh, the green colours are where there are equal marriage or blue colours where there is a version of marriage. The little red circles tell you where you can have joint adoption and the blue shields tell you where there are countries which have laws pro prohibiting discrimination. So the people on this call are going to be thinking about providing palliative care to LGBT plus people in countries all around the world, some of which those people are going to be facing all kinds of risk. The risk of COVID, but also the risk if they reveal their identity, that they may be discriminated against, they may be incarcerated, or they may be murdered. So I think it's really important we keep that in mind. Next slide, please, Stephen. Just to give you a quick introduction on why we talk about LGBT plus people in palliative care, there's a review there that I put up for you at the top. Because of behaviours linked to discrimination, we know in society groups that are discriminated against not only have worse mental health, but they also have higher incidence of life-limiting and life-threatening disease due to the risk behaviours that are linked to discrimination. So, for example, higher alcohol consumption, higher smoking rates linked to being a minority group and discrimination. And so there's a greater risk of certain cancers, Fears of discrimination from healthcare providers can lead to later presentation of disease amongst LGBT uh, people. They, people do report experiences of discrimination from healthcare providers. We have to remember, that as, a, as a hospice movement, we began, began from a, a very church-affiliated movement, which has not always been accepting of LGBT plus people. And there is a literature recognising some of the social exclusion in access to hospice care, which includes homeless people, incarcerated people, LGBT plus people. There is a literature that proves there is social exclusion in hospice and palliative care. 
Next slide, Stephen, please. Um, and the systematic review gives us some of the absolutely clear manifestations of social exclusion. So lesbian women with cancer report a lack of involvement of their partners in decision making. Uh, that actually, if you do disclose, you can and you get a good response from your healthcare provider, you can feel more supported by a healthcare service. But there are very, very clear examples of um, uh, healthcare providers not recognizing partners, rejecting partners. And also, there are all kinds of um, complexities when trying to work on advanced care directives or living wills because actually often legally partners are not recognized and families may not respect the wishes of the individual. So if we can have the next slide, please, Stephen. Stephen, thank you. And also we've looked at the bereavement literature of LGBT plus people that say, yes, of course, LGBT plus people will have the bereavement experiences of the rest of the population. I think Marvin gave us an incredibly powerful experience, uh, a report of what it's like to be bereaved when you're incarcerated. But there are also particular issues around time of death, which may be legal and financial. I have to remember for men who have sex with men, they've experienced multiple bereavements. And that's also the case in, in uh, some countries, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's been huge mortality from HIV AIDS. So there's all that resonant bereavement. We need to think professionally, what do we need to do to recognize this? How do we take into account people's social and family networks and really work with communities to provide adequate bereavement care to LGBT plus people? Next slide, please, Stephen. So I just want to give you a sense of what this actually means, because some people can't imagine what does this actually mean, this discrimination? How might it affect how a patient works with you? So this woman said, somebody of my age, my longer experiences of hiding my sexuality, not acknowledging that in a formal way. So there's always at the back of your mind, well, certainly at the back of my mind, that somebody will be negative about you. So you make a judgment. You spend a lot of energy trying to work out at what point in a conversation do you actually acknowledge and state your sexuality? It's not about the individual per se, it's about the risk assessment around that. So your patients are making an assessment of you and your service and deciding if I disclose to this, this care worker who I am in this person-centered assessment, are they going to discriminate against me? Are they going to reject me? Are they going to report me to the authorities, to my family? Or are they going to acknowledge me, accept me, and give me good palliative care? That's what it means. Next slide. Um, so dying quietly, here's some of the work from Jenny Hunt from uh, her work in Zimbabwe. So here's a, a director from a service in Zimbabwe. Isolation comes in, discrimination, and you may find people dying quietly without any family support. They will say you're doing your gay things on your own. That's why it's payback time for your sins. People will look at you and say it's now punishment for not having reproduced, getting married and not following the family tradition and going against God. And there are other paper, uh, quotes in Jenny's paper that report people actually being refused care, being refused treatment, defaulting on their antiretrovirals, and of course having very poor clinical outcomes. So next slide please, Stephen. So here's some work that I would really recommend you look at as well. Kim Aquaviva's book on LGBT plus inclusive hospice and palliative care. And there's also a forthcoming paper, which is now on the website of JPSM by Billy Rosa and, and uh, Kim, looking specifically at LGBT plus inclusive palliative care in COVID-19. So I really recommend you have a look at this. And some of the issues they raise, of course, we already know because of discrimination, population-based studies have shown us that LGBT plus people have worse mental health. So of course you compound that with the problems of COVID-19, then of course you really, really significant um, mental health issues. We're gonna have continued late presentation and, and lack of disclosure due to discrimination. During lockdown and social restrictions, people are not going to have face-to-face uh, uh, access to existing support networks and also we're going to have the compounding issues of lack of recognition of 
people's chosen advocates for decision making should they face end of life. So there are particularly important issues for us to be thinking about in the context of COVID-19, on top of all those other things that we've already identified. If we could have the next slide, Stephen. So I'll share with you the Access Care 10 cheap, simple recommendations for LGBT plus palliative care, which are in palliative medicine. First of all, at the individual level, think about the language you use. Are you presuming who somebody is? Are you talking about the woman with them as their sister or their friend? Or are you asking who they are? Are you being sensitive in your personal, person-centered uh, palliative care assessment? Which of course is what we pride ourselves on doing well, understanding the individual and what matters to them. Are we being sensitive in that? Are we respecting the individual's preferences? We don't advocate forced outing, and Billy talks about that in his paper and in his recommendations. Are we being sensitive in helping people to disclose but not forcing them? Are we understanding people's intimate relationships? Are we explicitly including the right people in discussions and decision making? At the service level, are we making clear statements about our views on discrimination? Are we including people in our diversity and discrimination training? Is there visibility? Really simple things. Are you wearing a rainbow, rainbow identity anywhere? Do you have same-sex individuals in your materials? And are you working with community groups to help you feel more confident in how you present your service and how you train? And last slide, Stephen, I think. So lastly, some more notes, briefing note recommendations from Billy and other colleagues. We need to make sure we're training. We need to make sure we're identifying social support systems. We need to be inclusive in every encounter. We need to be thinking about who surrogate decision makers are. We need to make sure we are empathic and non-judgmental all the time. I'm sure we believe we are, but we need to have a check. We need to reflect. We need to avoid being personally curious. If you have a trans person before you, you don't have any right to ask about their surgery or their genitals. Be, don't be curious, be empathetic. Be self-reflective. Think about what you say and do. We can't eliminate all bias immediately. It's a long-term goal, but we can at least acknowledge and fight against it. And then we need to acknowledge, approach and report any issues we, we think about practice. I think that's my last slide, Stephen. Yes. So thank you all very much. And yes, I acknowledge the map was slightly out of date. It was the last map from ILGA, who's a charity that produced these maps. And sorry, Australia wasn't represented correctly, I see in the comments there. So thank you very much for your time today. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, always um, interesting to, to hear um, some of the challenges for different groups of people. And the next group of people we're going to hear about is for people experiencing homelessness. So our next speaker is Elise Skinner, who is a nurse working with the Ottawa Inner City Health in Canada, a health care organization dedicated to health equity and supporting and coordinating the health care needs of homeless and structurally vulnerable people. Prior to this, she worked as an educator on an inpatient palliative care unit, um, again in Ottawa, and managed an initiative to improve access to palliative care for homeless and structurally vulnerable individuals in the wider national capital region. So we are delighted that Elise has been able to join us and she's going to be talking about palliative care for people experiencing homelessness in the time of COVID-19. So welcome Elise. Thank you very much and I'm uh, happy to be part of this conversation and to represent uh, the, the briefing note that was put together by my international colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. So certainly I am going to be speaking from my, also from my experience um, in terms of working from a more resource context and I will draw on some of those experiences to highlight some of the current challenges. And I would encourage you to consult the briefing note as well that's available now. Next slide, please. I think it's important to start by understanding this context of people experiencing homelessness before COVID. 
because what COVID has done is really compound health inequities and the vulnerability that people are experiencing in terms of their health and well-being. And before COVID, we, we've been in ongoing public health crises in terms of access to primary care, access to housing as a basic need, and an epidemic of deaths from drug overdoses. And this has only been worsened by the crisis. People experiencing um, homelessness are already disproportionately represented in people um, experiencing chronic health conditions. So COPD, heart disease, uh, people with immunodeficiencies, and as well as an aging population globally of people who are homeless. And when you think about this, it's really, these are your risk factors for mortality from COVID-19. So we have a highly vulnerable population um, to death from COVID. And before the pandemic, access to palliative care, high quality palliative care has been really limited uh, and let alone access to primary care. Although it's really important to understand that primary care and palliative care are um, part of the same, same work. Next slide, please. So when we think about vulnerability, uh, there's different ways to frame this, but I, I think it, defining the term structural vulnerability is really important. And when we also think about populations um, that we think about as amenable to a, a palliative approach to care. And so people who are homeless are, have a life limiting condition because of their vulnerability. And people experiencing homelessness are comprised of a number of structurally vulnerable groups. So gender minorities, sexual minorities, people who use drugs. Um, uh, I just, just one second. And again, I think being able to understand the vulnerability through the definition of greater structural forces at place that really limit people's choices and make people more vulnerable to harm. And so again, homelessness is a life-limiting condition that preceded the COVID epidemic. If you can have the next slide, please. So again, when it comes to challenges, the basic access to healthcare, social care, including palliative care medicines continues. And there are specific challenges to people living on the street uh, in terms of following infection prevention and control measures. Uh, it's impossible to have access to bathrooms, to be able to wash your hands, to have access to masks or to socially distance. And within shelters, similarly, it's congregate living arrangements. And, in, and that includes shared accommodations, uh, shared access to food, shared access to um, bathrooms where these shelter systems exist. Uh, next slide, please. And again, more challenges. When we think of people who use drugs, uh, in order to be able to access drugs, you have to be going out um, and having contact to access money, to buy your drugs. For people who are on methadone maintenance, it requires daily dispenses um, and acquiring the money to buy those drugs. And people with severe and persistent mental illness are certainly, um, when you think about the challenge of understanding the basic public health messaging will be very difficult for individuals who have dementia, who are in our residential hospice, um, who have lived on the street. So it's very difficult to contain um, their care when there's wandering behaviors. And again, <clears throat> when it comes to the overall resources that we have, they're really limited in the context of COVID because priorities have shifted. And in where we have a residential hospice here, um, that has shifted to being able to keep people safe. And so as in many other palliative care contexts, it reduces social contacts, the contacts. And overall, healthcare systems are very vulnerable because when we think about the risk of widespread transmission that could happen in congregate living environments like shelters or people congregating um, sleeping rough, the transmission can happen really quickly to a population that's really vulnerable and susceptible to dying from COVID. And, and that creates um, a real risk to the healthcare system 
in terms of the surge capacity to, to deal with a large number of people becoming quite ill uh, quite quickly. And certainly when we think about the surge protocols and how that relates to the allocation of healthcare resources like um, ventilators, um, that really is um, prioritized for people who um, don't have underlying health conditions like COPD, which are overrepresentative in the, in the homeless population. Next slide, please. Uh, so even before the pandemic, but this continues, people experiencing homelessness have limited access to basic communication tools that we consider commonplace. So phones and internet, so it limits people's ability to socially connect. It limits people's ability to um, access up-to-date public health information and to make appointments. And in other jurisdictions, some hostels where they exist, they may not fall under either health or social care. So it really limits that um, sometimes the ability to personal protective equipment. Next slide, please. So what we're seeing, so people's sources of income are really affected. And so when it comes to being able to um, panhandle, for example, some people, there are fewer people out because of social isolation. People are reluctant to have contact, so people are receiving less money. And there is a lot of desperation because um, the suffering is compounded um, in terms of access to uh, drugs for people who are substance users. Um, drug supplies have been affected by the closure of borders, so the drugs that are out there are more toxic and more people are dying. Um, because of that. And again, uh, this is, and some sources of income are changed where there's government benefits that are more easily accessed and suddenly having a large amount of money can also be deadly and we've seen that. Um, overall, COVID-19 compounds poverty. Uh, and so we're seeing more unemployment and then there's the risk of increased homelessness. And there are also silver linings in terms of um, how people, some jurisdictions have provided uh, supports for uh, tablets to increase connectivity uh, for people who are receiving palliative care supports. So some positive things. Uh, next slide, please. So recommendations. So certainly recognizing um, people experiencing homelessness as a really high risk group uh, for mortality and for transmitting the virus and really having this prioritized um, across the healthcare system. So primary health care, acute care, and in the community resources that are deployed. Really integrating the principles of palliative care to the homeless. Um, and this precedes the pandemic, but certainly it's important to do this now. So having trauma-informed approaches, having flexible admission criteria, uh, including harm reduction services across the board and estimating and planning for adequate palliative care support. So it's really anticipating needs and where possible having uh, some infrastructure in place, anticipating the needs of medications. And so having that ready to be able to provide those, um, that additional care. Next slide, please. Prioritizing advanced care planning and so really having conversations, identifying substitute decision makers is so important, the legal substitute decision maker, and also being realistic, as I mentioned, with surge protocols with hospitals where making clear what, what choices might really realistically be available um, under those conditions so that people are really making informed choices about their wishes. We're experiencing a pandemic of grief and, and really it's essential to have grief and bereavement supports enhanced. Um, and again, providing emotional support to frontline workers and, and palliative care training as part of the essential toolbox. I think this has been important before the pandemic, but certainly that continues. Next slide, please. And in terms of enhanced interprofessional collaborations, it's thinking about um, how different workers can really support the needs, um, emotional, spiritual, um, how there needs to be ways to, to reach out to individuals in terms of breaking social isolation 
which really compounds grief and, and worsens outcomes. And on a, another level, including economic assessments as part of palliative care intakes. And this is again, precedes, um, precedes this pandemic, but it's really identifying people who may be at risk for homelessness and how to anticipate what good palliative care looks like. Um, you need to know what is possible for people on a financial point of view as well. And dignified burial and cremation. Uh, and this includes people who may be unidentified and that we're um, providing a respectful and dignified um, burial or cremation along with um, appropriate customs and norms. Next slide, please. And I wanted to uh, end, and I know it was presented earlier on, but really the intersection of good public health um, and palliative care, because again, we're in multiple public health crises, and there's really this relationship to systemic inequities. And so um, really the need for systemic change is part, of, um, is part of this, but it's also important to have really concrete actions where possible to be able to house people in, in conditions where they can isolate safely, have access to a private bathroom, and certainly that's not possible everywhere but at a minimum being able to provide people with basic sanitation so that we can keep people healthy and alive. And I think it's also really important to um, integrate harm reduction measures um, from the literature we know that um, we should be uh, really accelerating access to addiction treatment services and not postponing this um, uh, during the COVID pandemic. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Elise, for your for your presentation and uh, for sharing some of your um, vast experience as well. One of the challenges that we had um, in doing this, uh, the briefing notes, is trying to um, accommodate or, or include perspectives from a wide variety of different situations. Um, having worked uh, across Africa quite a lot and particularly in Uganda and also having worked in the UK I've um, I've actually been providing palliative care in a UK prison and in a Uganda prison very different um, very different situations in terms of responding to um, people um, living on the streets and, and homelessness and also again very different uh, perspectives around uh, supporting um, the LGBT plus people. So just before we go into our question and answers, I'm going to firstly ask Joan, uh, Joan Marston, who I'm sure most of you will know, um, currently working with Pal Chase. I'm going to ask her just to share a couple of um, a, a couple of minutes around some of the different perspectives from a low middle income country. So Joan, over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, and I'm from Nelson Mandela country, and I do so wish, Marvin, that the Nelson Mandela rules were fully implemented here. I'm working in a very impoverished area doing hospice and palliative care in the community, and the impact that we're seeing of COVID um, in already impoverished communities is absolutely extreme. I worked through the AIDS epidemic in the 90s and the early 20s, and I've never seen the type of poverty we're seeing now. People have lost their jobs because they've lost their jobs and they, we have little access to social support, is that they are, there's increased poverty. They're struggling to get the health services because the, the health services are becoming overwhelmed in our area now with COVID-19. Um, and just yesterday, I had to stand and watch a 14-year-old die because if he'd been able to access his health services, then he could have received treatment. Or if his mother had had the money to take him to private health, he would not have died. And I saw this mother who'd lost her job. She was living on the child support grant from two children. Immediately, the child support grant is stopped after death. She's now trying to live on a tiny support grant, the equivalent of about four pounds. Um, for herself and her daughter, and this could lead to homelessness. And of course, the homelessness we're seeing um, increasing on the streets. 
and this is increasing the crime as well. And so I think, you know, working and living in, in these low resourced areas shows just how fragile our systems are. If our grandmothers who look after the children in, and who are a high risk group for COVID, if they get ill and die, who's going to look after the children? And so this is really a human rights matter. And every, everyone deserves good health care and good palliative care. And as Cicely Sanders said, Richard, you matter. Every life matters. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. And uh, these are such um, challenging times at the moment. Um, and it's really important to uh, hear different perspectives. So I'm just going to ask um, Susie and, and those of you who were on the call last week would have met Susie, Susie last week. Um, but I'm just going to ask her to share a couple of uh, for a couple of minutes on some perspectives from um, Argentina um, to give us a, another another viewpoint as well. So if you're there, Susie. I can't actually see Susie. Uh, hello, I cannot. Uh, That's all right, we can hear you. We can hear you, that's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ah. ah, now we can see you as well. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, well, I just uh, like to share some words regarding the reality in my own country and uh, in Latin America. Um, it is important to, to highlight that uh, the need to listen to those who have no voice and cannot shout enough uh, to gain equal access uh, to the effective exercise of their rights. The pandemic, uh, especially in Latin America, has exposed the reality of millions of people around the world who lack adequate access to the health system and whose most basic rights are constantly being violated. Uh, in Latin America, the social determinants of health are those that have the highest prevalence, but uh, however, they are the most silenced. Um, this is a very painful reality in our countries. Uh, in Latin America, we are witnessing, especially uh, in Argentina, a biological reductionism, where the holistic definition of health uh, promulgated by who seems to have been totally ignored. Uh, it is important to emphasize that we are not just a virus, we are persons, and our social, family, and work realities, our idiosyncrasies and individual needs must be addressed when implementing uh, public policies. Uh, in Latin America, LGBT plus people, homeless and prisoners, see their right to access palliative care ignored on a daily basis. Uh, they are discriminated, exposed to violence, and mostly, especially in the case of homeless and inmates, living in inhuman conditions. Access to health services is almost difficult and absent. Uh, we have beautiful laws in my country and in Latin America that guarantee rights, but many just do not apply. Uh, palliative care is a human right guaranteed by our local legislations, but we lack palliative care services in prisons and we do not have uh, mobile palliative care teams that can address homeless people and uh, LGBT plus people uh, often avoid health systems because of fear of discrimination. The quarantine has created a perfect storm for the violation of rights in Latin America. Isolation facilitates and silences situations of violation of rights and promotes them. What we do not know generates panic and panic produces irrational reactions. Uh, the virus scares us, but the best protection against the virus is to develop greater humanity, to see in the other someone like each of us who needs us, because despite the differences, dignity is the principle that unites us regardless of our individual characteristics and behavior. Situations of exception, humanitarian crisis, pandemic, 
require rated ethical and legal safeguards, not less. And those with greater needs and greater risks of infringement must be uh, treated as a pri priority. And um, I think that we who work in palliative care have the duty to speak up for them. So thank you. Thank you, Susie. Again, some powerful words there. And we do, as people working in palliative care, need to speak up for those most vulnerable who we are providing and trying to provide care. So thank you all very much. Um, we're now going to move on to the question and answers. Um, we, we're not using the um, putting your hand up function. Um, so please write your questions in the chat box. And uh, you have uh, met all of our pan panelists. Stephen is also around, as is Liliana. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Kate, who's going to start with the questions. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for these incredibly um, insightful and really hard hitting presentations. Um, it's really um, quite something to learn about the conditions um, that some groups of the population face um, that people who are privileged just don't even think about. Um, so a lot of the questions in the chat have been mainly expressing um, you know, appreciation for the presentations, um, but we do have a couple. Um, the first one is a question from India, um, saying palliative care is totally missing in prisons and the healthcare providers have no adequate knowledge of providing care in these settings. This is really painful and obviously a violation of human rights. What actions can the relevant authorities take and how can we advocate for this? Catherine and Marvin, would you like to respond? <laughs> oh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just sure that uh, uh, the voices that we most need to listen to are inside the prisons. And uh, uh, my friend uh, Brian Stevenson says that you're not going to fix brokenness until you become proximal to it. And so I truly believe that it's going to be people coming out of the gates of the prison system that's going to help you fix the brokenness of that system, uh, which was why we created the Brothers Keepers Inside, which is why, I mean, uh, with Robert, they, they did a psychological autopsy and wanted to know why did he kill himself instead of going to a psychologist in the prison. And we had to tell him because if you go to somebody official in the prison, they put it in your file and that file goes before the parole board and you're denied parole. So they just stuff it and then eventually they turn it in on themselves, they kill themselves. Uh, one of the greatest fears that people have is dying in prison. And uh, you need somebody who understands that great fear. Uh, so when you're dealing with prisoners, you have to train your palliative caregivers uh, uh, from the population that you're dealing with. You have, to, you have to bring that knowledge into these men and women who are incarcerated so they can turn to their fellows and, and help them in this last part of their life's journey. Uh, unfortunately, the people who work prison hospitals, the people who are the medical administrators in the prison system, often come from the ranks of the correctional uh, staff and uh, or uh, opt in after being in the military uh, and uh, and they have no conception about the the culture inside the prison uh, it's uh, prison is a place where violence is bred and uh, the things that happen in prison if if they took the chance of letting people understand that these are human beings. They will not be able to do what they do in the mass incarceration uh, that they do would be impossible. So it's very dangerous when you start saying, well, let's train people to treat these people like human beings. It, it, it's almost an immediate reaction from the, the administrators of the prison system is like, no, no, they're animals. D do not trust them and do not uh, uh, 
propose that we treat them any different than we are because they are dangerous. And so people buy into that. And uh, the, the fact that they're behind walls and people drive by every day, they just imagine the darkness that's in there. They do not know that there's souls, that there's mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and uncles and aunts. So what we have to do is demand that our prisons that we pay for provide at least the minimal care necessary to recognize the humanness of the people that are chained in those prisons. And once we start recognizing this humanness, I think that thing that's inherent in all human beings, uh, I don't know, I think that, I think that, that once people recognize the humanness of these people that we've chained, that there will be other things that we want to do other than locking them up and, and, and keeping them in cages until their last breath. So I think just um, uh, making it mandatory that governments that lock people up must recognize the humanness of those people and require at least this minimal care, at least that a person doesn't die chained to a bed, at least that a person has nutritious food even as his body is given up to the dark, he will leave sated and and able to uh, face this uh, inevitable end without pain. That's all we can ask. Thank you. Kate. Thank you, uh, Marvin, and thank you, Julia. Um, the next question is, um, how do we support hospice and palliative care services to move from a generalized, our doors are open to everyone response to a recognition that a more active response is needed to reach the more, most marginal, marginalized and key populations? For instance, what can the international palliative care organizations do? The risk is that COVID will make inequalities much, much worse and we must all respond. Mm. If I, if I could make a comment on that, I think that's a really, really important point. If you believe that you're open to everybody, then that's kind of complacent and the, the inequity will continue to really be seeking out inequality and reducing social exclusion. It does take a proactive approach. I think Marvin's an absolutely perfect example of that. We've got some examples of that in the UK with LGBT plus people. You have to engage the community because if you don't get the, because communities don't have palliative care at the top of their agenda. You have to help them to think about it and recognize that inequity. And you have to help, you have to listen. What do we need to do to make our service reflect you, respond to your needs? How do you get people into the building? How do you make them feel part of your service? Because if you just take a, an approach of we do not discriminate, you can be pretty sure that you do. Thanks, Richard. And, and Elise, perhaps you might like to share some of your experience in, in Ottawa in reaching out to the needs of the homeless and structurally vulnerable people. Um, I think it's continuing the work that we're doing, um, but certainly um, I see you know, there's a question around integrating um, harm reduction approaches. And we have a residential hospice for people who are homeless and we've had experience through there in terms of um, managed alcohol programs and integrating that into um, the work that we do and manage opiate programs. So it's transitioning people who are using uh, substances in maybe an uncontrolled way and still making that part of their life, but making it in a way that's more, um, that's safer, um, making sure people aren't drinking non-beverage uh, alcohol and instead it's safe it's safer but within the context of COVID-19 as I said there's the opiate overdose crisis has gotten worse uh, here in our region um, over the three months of the pandemic where it's really hit us overdose deaths have gone up by 25 percent and so there's really a need um, to expand um, different options for people um, to to get them away from a deadly drug supply. And when we think about intravenous drug users, I, you know, I think it's, it's really thinking these are people who are at really high risk of dying and now even more so with an even more compromised drug supply. 
And so one of the initiatives that we have uh, here in Ottawa and elsewhere is uh, safe supply. Uh, so for people who are using um, drugs like fentanyl that are really deadly, it's being able to have them access through connection with a physician and a nurse, um, a, a daily supply of opiates that is safe um, and that basically keeps them alive. Um, so those, that's one example. Thank you. And I think there was also part of that question was around what could the global organizations do. So I'm going to put Stephen and um, Liliana on the spot here and just wonder about your, your thoughts on what we as global organizations can do. Well, uh, webinars like this actually are a good place to start to be able to uh, give people tools to work with to improve access for uh, vulnerable populations. I think also our, our members and national organizations. Um, we had in the US, um, our first you know standard uh, for palliative care operation was to have an outreach program to educate the community to reach out to underserved populations to, to assess who is in the population and know your population that you're caring for. So we encourage our members to do that. Liliana, any thoughts? Uh, thank you. I, I was just thinking also that um, there is a lack of uh, representation in our, um, probably in our governing bodies. And that is something that, um, you know, going forward with, um, you know, with Richard's comment and Marvin's comments as well, that we have to take a very proactive um, position and uh, taking the steps to change the culture, not outside also, but especially within. And um, I think these are some very good reflections. So um, advocate for our, um, you know, changes within the structure of our own organizations to include, um, you know, be proactive of including uh, persons, uh, you know, with uh, just that are very vulnerable, um, you know, and, and some of the groups that we have represented in this um, seminar on others. And that would be a, a very good example, setting an example to other organizations um, and civil society um, organizations working in the field. Um, there's also one issue that I think we need to incorporate, um, and that is we have been advocating for um, education in palliative care um, uh, for uh, health professions. And I think there's also this issue of um, in, including education um, in the legal field uh, for, um, you know, the barristers and lawyers and all the other careers um, that are re relevant to human rights um, on palliative care um, as a component of the right to health uh, for all populations and not just um, those who are um, having a condition or a disease. Um, so uh, just some thoughts. And thanks for the opportunity. This is very um, inspiring. Thanks, Liliana. And uh, before I hand back over to Kate, just to say you, um, there's a picture here of Gaitri. Um, she was going to join us, but she got called um, away at the last minute. So she sends her apologies. Um, so Kate, any, any more questions? Um, thanks, Julia. Um, the next question is um, in resource limited settings, what would be the best first step as part of a national program in considering palliative, hosp palliative and hospice care for these uh, special patient groups? Who would like to tackle that one? Joan, can I pick on you? Yeah, I think Perhaps the first step would be to do an assessment of the numbers and what is available so that you have a picture of all the resources that could be available. And I think there's a lot we can learn from what happened when HIV and AIDS hit. hit. And for those of us who worked through that time um, of the AIDS epidemic, we saw that training people in the community, training lay people in community care was ab absolutely key for us reaching those populations. And I think Marvin, what you did within the prison um, was, was actually an example of this, wasn't it? Making a community where you could reach out and help others. And so I think that um, training of community people, looking at, at models like the compassionate communities, compassionate neighbors, the Kerala model, 
are all models that we can that we can use as the basis for reaching out to these groups. And if I could add to that, Joan, I mean, I'd say the first job is always hearts and minds, isn't it? Mm. So making sure that your board and your management are on board, that they see this and that it matters, and then your staff, do your policies reflect an inclusive approach? What do your policies say that you've got something to refer back to? And then to identify those groups in your community, who can we work with? I mean, those would be the first mm. things that I, would, that I would suggest. And also, I mean, I know... So the question from Romani was about resource limited settings, but we it's, we haven't got it right in high income settings either. So I think this is an area that um, all of us need to be uh, looking at how we can address and how we can improve things. Well, you know, in, in uh, resources are one thing. Uh, we we can't say that we can't afford uh, to provide this. Uh, in prisons in California, at least, and in most states, it's the highest budget item in any state you go to in the United States. $13 billion this last fiscal year to run 35 prisons in California. You can't tell me you don't have the money to put resources in, but when you, when, what I'm talking about is, is the very thing that Richard was talking about, the hearts and mind, it costs nothing to recognize the humanness of this person that you've shackled. But I will tell you what it will cost you not to consider that. Revenge is pernicious. And as you affect that revenge on these people you have chained in these cages, you are shedding pieces of your humanity. And uh, the darkness that I told you about in prison creeps out over the wall and, and in, invades your communities and your communities become dark. And so there's a cost for not recognizing humanness to these people that you chain. So, uh, you know, in 1981, uh, they had a young man named Ryan White who contracted uh, AIDS through uh, a tr blood transfusion. They wouldn't let him go to school. They burnt his house. His family had to leave. And in prison, where I was at that time, I was in prison from 1975 to 2016. In 1981, I had created an organization uh, some years before that to advocate for prisoners' rights. And one of the things that they did immediately was they started locking up people who were um, homosexual, or who were known to have HIV, they put them in segregation. They were, they were not allowed to be out. So we started going to court and advocating for their release. And we were able to show that the parole board required certain programs to meet muster to be paroled. And these people who were locked in the hole in segregation could not get to these programs. So now you've created a liberty interest. And the courts ruled that they had to be let out on the main line. So we were able to get all of the prisoners in California that were in segregation for being homosexual out. There was such a fear of these people, these humans that were coming out of segregation that other prisoners and guards were attacking them. Some prisoners killed some of these people. And we had to get uh, peer education programs installed in all the prisons to let people know that you cannot contract HIV by searching their cell or walking down a chair with them or eating in a chow hall with them or walking on a yard with them. And once this education was in place, the prisoners were fine with each other. It took a little while for the guards because they weren't taking these fair education programs. But once you shine that light into the shadows that people most fear and they see that there's nothing there to be afraid of, we can make progress. So uh, uh, there has to be more transparency in these uh, that when dealing with these populations. Uh, when when the cops go out and tear down homeless encampments here in the Bay Area in California, nobody cares. And and, and it's sometimes it's they take everything these people have, whatever little bit of thing they had in the shopping cart, they take it away. And who cares? They don't care about these people because they're not seen. They have no voice. They don't, people don't hear prisoners, they don't hear old people, they don't hear children, and they don't hear homeless people for the most part. 
So these voices have to be listened to. And we have to accept that as a responsibility as a sentient society that we do this. So no, it costs nothing. This resource I'm talking about is a resource that is empathic. It's, it's something that we should be doing as a human being for other human beings. And, and then we can talk about the financial costs later. Maybe, maybe we can buy one less missile or something. I don't know. Thank, thank you, uh, Marvin. And I think that's a, a good place really to, to stop as we think about how we can uh, make or enable those voices to be heard. And the fact that treating people humanely, um, showing love, dignity, respect, um, doesn't cost us. Um, from a financial perspective. So let's um, just think about uh, next week, moving on to next week. Stephen, could you tell us about our webinar next week? Yep, thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone. Th those were just moving, moving presentations, all of them. Um, and we know that uh, many of uh, our friends and colleagues around the world are having a hard time um, with keeping their, their operations going um, with funding cuts and with all the disruption that's going on. So we're doing a presentation next week at this same time on um, the risks and opportunities and challenges of fundraising during the pandemic. Um, we're gonna have um, one of our, our expert fundraisers, Dermot McDonald, uh, and someone who's on the call from Open Society Foundation, Dieter Gloman, and, and a couple of other people with us to next week. So we encourage you to join us. Um, and uh, we'll also be doing some, this, this will be the last presentation in this series of 14 uh, webinars, uh, at least uh, we're stopping it to, for the summer. And um, we, the four of us that are the execs for the international organizations are gonna just make some closing comments at the end, just to thank everyone and to, uh, to give some perspective on what we've gained from, I think, uh, all of the wonderful um, pre presentations that we've had through the last few months. So thank you, Julian. Thank you very much, Stephen. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, please do join us again next week. Um, but please do join me in thanking today's faculty members um, for Catherine, for Richard, Elise, Joan, Susie, and particularly for Marvin for sharing your experiences with us. And I think going back to, I think it was one of Richard's first slides um, when he was showing the words of uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, you matter because you are you. And each person who we care for matters because they are them, they are an individual. They ma you matter because you are you. And I think that's so important as we reflect on all that we've heard today. So on behalf of the Global Palliative Care Organisations, I'd like to thank you all for being part of our discussions today, for all that you are doing within palliative care and in particular at this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd like to challenge each one of us, having heard the presentations today, to think about how we can um, advocate for and improve the palliative care provision for such vulnerable groups. So please stay well and keep safe. Thank you.